Hello. I'd like to show you some of the work of my colleagues using statistical mechanics to model complex systems. Statistical mechanics is a theory that we use to understand and potentially manipulate nature at the atomic level. The first example I'll show you is from the area of systems biology. This is from the consortium of groups studying the dictostelian genome. On the right hand side is shown the protein interaction map of the proteins in this genome. And an inset is shown the interaction of just a few of these proteins. Focusing on one of these proteins, the cytoplasmic polyhedrosis virus, we see the structure shown here. The structure was solved by our colleagues Hong Zhao and Hua Chu here at Texas, and this is one of the largest protein structures that has been solved by cryoelectron microscopy, and at the highest resolution, 4.5 angstroms. Now we see even a small piece of this viral complex contains many amino acids, and then even a small piece of that contains several amino acids. So modeling of this giant complex is rather difficult. My colleague Zhang Peng Ma is using statistical mechanics to look at the structure and dynamics of this viral complex. In particular, he's interested how the dynamics of the structure can influence the properties of the virus, for example, the virus infectivity. As a next example, I turn to drug design. And for specificity, I focus on Abelson kinase and its inhibitor, Gleevec. Now, there are several other human proteins that are very similar to the Abelson kinase. Six of them are shown here. So structurally, it's not easy to distinguish Abelson kinase from these other six proteins. And yet, Gleevec is intended to do this. If there is difficulty in distinguishing the different structures, Gleevec will have side effects. Now, what are features that might be a little bit different among these proteins that Gleevec could be modified to couple to? How can we modify Gleevec so that it would be more specific just for Abelson kinase and have fewer side effects? In particular, what details of the atomic region that Gleevec interacts with can be modulated or manipulated to make Gleevec more specific. A theory that my colleague Ariel Fernandez has come up with is called wrapping. Wrapping is a concept that an amino acid interacts with its neighbors. And in particular, those neighbors either can be water molecules or other protein amino acids. And by manipulating the wrapping of amino acids, we can manipulate the chemical interactions. For example, by changing the wrapping of Gleevec by introducing two methyl groups shown at the top and the bottom of the molecule, this leads to Gleevec being much more specific for Abelson kinase, inhibiting Abelson kinase fairly specifically, and not inhibiting those other paralogs of Abelson kinase. As a final example, I turn to the immune system. The immune system, of course, protects us against death by infection. There is the B cell and the T cell component of the human immune system. T cells interact with many other cells. Even a T cell interacting with an antigen presenting cell interacts through many molecules. Modulation of these molecules is what leads to the activation of T cells. Now, T cells evolve and proliferate in lymph nodes. And here I show an image or a video taken with two photon microscopy of T cells moving around in a, uh, a lymph node of a mouse. If there is no antigen present, then the T cells tend to move around really rather randomly. If there is antigen present, then some of the T cells, about 1 in 10 to the 5 on average, will interact with the antigen. They'll form clusters, such as shown here. And those T cells that interact with the antigen, they will divide and proliferate. And after a few days, those T cells that interact, they're still forming clusters. They're much dimmer because they lose their fluorescence by a factor of 2 every time they divide. Those T cells that do not interact, they are still bright, and they're moving around really rather randomly and quickly. So the challenge then is to go from this basic biology to an understanding of the immune response to, for example, a vaccine. And as, as a first example, I choose dengue fever. There are four components of, or the four strains of dengue fever. Dengue fever infects about 100 million people worldwide. It's been called one of the most important viral diseases transmitted by humans. Now, one interesting fact about dengue is that vaccination against one of the strains actually leads to higher susceptibility to the other three strains. So vaccination against all four strains simultaneously is of great interest. This is difficult, though, because the immune response is not equivalent to the four different strains of the vaccine. And there is no four-component vaccine that works sufficiently well to be licensed at the present time. Again, we'd like to use statistical mechanics to understand the immune response well enough to predict, for example, the outcome of clinical trials of vaccines. So shown on the left-hand side are data from clinical trial of a putative four-component 
a trial of war component vaccine. And on the right hand side, at first are replotted the clinical data shown in shaded, and then in open are shown results from the statistical mechanics model. Once we have a model of the immune response to vaccine, then we can test improved vaccines or improved vaccine deliveries. For example, we find that polytopic vaccination gives about a 100% improvement to the least effective component of the vaccine. So it, it reduces the immunodominance, it makes the vaccine about twice as effective overall. As another example, I turn to cancer. Cancer vaccines are one strategy for treatment of cancer these days. Again, we need to go from fairly complicated and complex interaction of the immune system and the cancer proliferation to a statistical mechanics model that reproduces clinical trial data. We can then evaluate new strategies for design of cancer vaccines or design of uh, administration of cancer vaccines, cancer vaccine delivery. A particular interest is the randomness and the complexity of the immune response. And finally, I close with a discussion of the design of the annual flu shot. Annually worldwide, the uh, flu kills a fairly large number of people. The mortality is increased by a factor of three if people with underlying conditions such as heart disease are included. Worldwide, uh, the flu tends to infect about 5 to 15 percent of the total population. In the U.S., the annual cost due to lost work and uh, medical expenses is about $10 billion a year every flu season. And if there were a pandemic, the cost and really the, uh, the, the damage to the U.S. Uh, economy and to the public health overall really would be very significant. So there's a great interest in designing the flu shot with higher efficacy. The flu shot is not always designed as to be as efficacious as it could be, both due to difficulties in the design and to mutation of the flu from year to year. It's possible to develop predictive tools for vaccine efficacy from statistical mechanics. These tools shown in center are more predictive than current bioinformatics approaches and really even more predictive than animal model studies in ferrets shown in the lower right. So I've shown you a few examples of using statistical mechanics to model complex systems. My colleagues and I are very interested in working on new areas of uh, public health and nanomedicine uh, with you all. Thank you.